Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Inshallah, I will continue with our reading through Imam Nawawi's Atibyan fi Adabi Hamadat al Quran, translated as Etiquette with the Quran. And we're in the chapter on the etiquettes of recitation. And as someone pointed out, it, it seems like this really should be recitation and prayer. But you should take note that the bulk of the rulings right now that we're discussing do have to do with recitation and prayer. But at the beginning of the chapter, he did talk about general rulings that apply both in and outside of prayer. And right now, he's doing some rulings that are related to prayer. And soon, he's going to get back into rulings that are also in and outside of prayer. So it just seems that way right now, that it's about recitation in prayer. And it makes sense because prayer is the best time in which someone can be reciting the Qur'an. Because they're going to compound both the recitation of the Qur'an, which is ibadah, as well as salat, which is ibadah. And so it makes sense that a good portion of the rulings here would be would pivot around recitation within prayer. And what I read last time and where we stopped in the book had to do with the four occasions within the prayer where an imam is supposed to pause a little bit and to give the, the congregants behind him um, time to do things or to ensure that there's a, a clear separation between what has been said already and what's about to be said. So for example, he says, after the opening takbirat al-ihram, there's a small pause. And that pause then allows people to say the takbir if they're following an imam. And it also allows people to read the opening dua. And then there should be a pause on either side of al-fatiha. And then there should also be a pause after saying Amin. And then there should also be a pause after finishing the recommended recitation after Al-Fatiha. Some of these pauses are to allow the, the congregants to say what they need to say. And some of them are to ensure that Quran that is read is clearly separated from from other things okay so the last thing that he mentioned or the second to last was about saying amin in prayer and that's where we're going to pick up today so the author of our book imam anawi rahimahullah said it is recommended for every reciter whether or not it is during prayer to say amin when finishing al-fatiha the rigorously authenticated hadiths concerning this are well known and numerous. And because of that, Imam Anawi isn't going to come and mention them because they're really well known. We mentioned in the previous section that it is recommended to separate the end of Al Fatiha and Amin with a brief pause of silence. So the Imam is going to read Wala Dalin. Pause, pause. I mean, okay, so there needs to be a pause there. They shouldn't be connected. There should be a pause. Okay, so great. We know this. What's I mean mean? That's going to be one issue that he's going to talk about. And another issue he's about to talk about is how is I mean pronounced? And we might be surprised that this would need to be discussed today. But something we should be aware of is that the Arabic language was very, very rich with many, many dialects that were spoken in different regions. And the pronunciation that we have today tends to reflect one of the pronunciations of the past. So we shouldn't be surprised when we get into more precise and critical and scholarly works that they discuss the proper way to pronounce a word and whether or not there's alternative pronunciations that are valid 
and whether or not there were pronunciations that people um, transmitted that were incorrect. And this is very important because we want to make sure that we pronounce the Qur'an correctly. We also want to make sure that we don't pounce on someone who is pronouncing it correctly, but different than we do. Okay, so the, these are important issues. And Imam Nawawi tends to leave most of this information to the end of this book. And so if he brings it into the main text, it's because he feels that there's a need to do it. So that's going to be another issue. He's going to talk about the different ways it's pronounced. And he's also going to talk about um, the relationship of the imam's utterance of Amin and the followers. So he's going to get into these issues next. And he says, We mentioned in the previous section that it is recommended to separate the end of Al-Fatiha and Amin with a brief pause of silence. Amin means, O oh Allah, answer. Okay, O oh Allah, answer what? O oh Allah, answer our prayer. Okay, O oh Allah, answer our supplication, answer our dua, um, answer the adhkar that we make. But in this case, it's answer the prayer that we make when we recite Al-Fatiha. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. Right? So this is something that uh, it, it's a dua and the amin here is an affirmation. It's a, it's a request to Allah to, to answer that. And this is something even if we're absolutely sure that we've been guided, we, we still should be making the request. And why is that? Because we want to maintain guidance. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was definitely guided. He, he recited it and he asked for it. Because when we ask for something we already have, what the dua means is we want to keep it and we want an increase in it. Okay, so anyways, Amin means, O oh Allah, answer. That's the main opinion. That's the strongest opinion um, in, in, that you'll get in a lot of books. And sometimes it's the only opinion they'll mention. Other opinions are that it means, and like this, let it be, and make it so, and of this only you are capable, and do not let down our hope, or, O oh Allah, entrust us with goodness. These are other meanings that have been conveyed for the phrase, Amin. And there's more. Other opinions proffer, it is Allah's seal on his worshippers, and it repels disasters from them. It is a level in paradise that one who says it deserves. It is one of the names of Allah Most High, but the accomplished authorities, the muhaqiqin, and the majority of scholars have rejected this, this last opinion, or it is a Hebrew word which has been Arabized. Okay, so it has um, origins in, in Hebrew, but it was adopted into the Arabic language, and it now conforms to Arabic grammar. Abu Bakr al warraq said that this is power, that it means it is power endowed in the supplication which causes mercy to descend, and there are more opinions yet. I think Imam Manawi mentions here or somewhere that he has listed over 15 different um, opinions that have been transmitted on the meaning of Amin. There are various pronunciations concerning Amin. The opinions of the scholars are that the purest linguistically is to say amin with elongation and lightening of the meme. Okay, elongation meaning that there's a med and lightening meaning that there's no shadda. So amin. The second opinion is with the aleph being short, amin. The third opinion, these two opinions are well known and the third opinion is that it is um, amin with imala. And this is where the aleph is pronounced like the ya, with elongation between the two. Okay, so I, the qira'ah, the recitation that I, I learned, doesn't have imala. And so 
I'm sorry, it does. It has it in, in one verse. Um, and so when it comes to trying to, re to say Amin with Imala, it's really difficult for me to do. It, it's similar. It's kind of like saying Amin, where, where there's a Ya-ish sound to it. But once you are used to pronouncing, to uttering a word with a particular pronunciation, it can be difficult for you to break out of the mold unless it's something you do all the time. So someone who's mastered more than one recitation can switch back and forth with ease. It's quite amazing. Um, but if you've only done one, it's not so easy to do. I remember when I was studying uh, calligraphy, khat, with uh, Sheikh Shukri Lahfi, that I just, I couldn't believe that you could learn to write calligraphy with one, one way and then on a dime switch to a completely uh, or a quite dissimilar way of writing but it's something you learn how to do okay with practice you can learn to switch back and forth between the different pronunciations just like you can learn to switch back and forth between different writing styles but it takes practice and unfortunately i don't have the practice for doing the word amin with imala so this is my shortcoming, and may Allah forgive me for it. Al-Wahidi conveys us from Hamza and Al-Kasai, and these are two of the sheikhs of Qira'a, two of the sheikhs of the seven um, styles of Qira'a, over which there is consensus. Um, so there are two of the seven over which there's consensus. And we talked about Qira'a earlier on, and it's going to come later on in the book again. So the fourth opinion posits that the meme has a shadda with elongation. So, Amin. And Al-Wahidi conveys this from Al-Hasan and Al-Hasan ibn Fadl. So Al-Hasan here would presumably be Al-Hasan al-Basri and al Hussein ibn al-Fadl. And he said, this is al-Wahidi said, and al-Wahidi is a great early um, mufassar or exegete of the Qur'an. He says, this is confirmed by what was related from Ja'far al-Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, that he said its meaning is, to you do we direct ourselves and you are more generous than to turn back something, someone seeking you. These are Al-Wahidi's words. This fourth opinion is very strange indeed, and most of the lexicographers consider it to be an error made by laymen. Okay. So, the reading of Amin with a shadda on the meme is something that it's done, but it's a mistake. Okay, so that is the fourth opinion. The Imam Anawi says this fourth opinion is very strange indeed, and most of the lexicographers considered it an error made by laymen. And a group of our Shafi companions said, whoever says it in their prayer like this, his prayer is invalid. Okay, so try to make sure when you say Amin that you put a Mad on the Aleph, and a med on the ya, and that you don't elong, you don't put a shadda on the mean. So amin. So even if the people around you aren't doing it correctly, you at least do it correctly, inshallah. Arabic linguists said that the proper Arabic usage de demands that there be a full stop after. Excuse me. When we say amin. What if we connect it to what follows? What if we don't put a, a pause after it? And we should put a pause after saying Amin, right? But what if we don't? What if we connect it to what comes next? So what if we were to say, like for example, the Basmala afterwards? Would it be Amin? Would it be Amin Bismillah? Without that pause there? Would it be with a sukun on the noon? So, amin bismillah. Or would it be something else? And what he's going to tell us is Arabic 
a phonology and phonology is a discipline in linguistics that studies how words, how phonemes, how letters are pronounced when they're put into context, when they're put together. Okay, so what happens when a noon, which typically has a sakun on it, is followed by another letter that has a haraka on it, that has a fatha or a kasra or a dhamma? How does it get pronounced? Because in Arabic, there's many cases where you, you can't really stop with a sakun on the noon. You need to do something to it. There's many words like this in Arabic, where for various reasons, they don't keep the sakun when they connect it. And he's going to mention a few. Okay, so is, is it going to be one of those? So is it going to be amin bismillah? Or is it going to be amina bismillah? Or is it going to be something else? Because sometimes when Arabic connects two words together, it's going to give them a fatha or it's going to give them a kasra to make the pronunciation easier and quicker. So it turns out that amin is one of those words, but let's see what he says. Arabic linguists said that the proper Arabic usage demands that there be a full stop there after the noon and amin because it has the rank of a phoneme. Okay. But if it is connected, meaning if it's connected to what comes next, the noon gets a fatha because of the consecutiveness of two silent letters. What are the two silent letters? The ya before the noon has a sukun, and then the noon has a sukun on it. Okay, and so he says if it is connected, the noon gets a fatha because of the consecutiveness of the two silent letters. Arabic doesn't like to have two letters with sukun one after the other and then something connected to it it doesn't it doesn't like this it's doesn't work with its its uh, system so just like it is given a fatha in the words ein and kaf if you look at the word ein it's got a sukun on it so if you said um what did what did she say to you she said ein fine but if you said, Aina dhahabat, you, you have to put that fatha. You can't say, Ain dhahabat. You got to put the fatha there. This is the way Arabic works, okay? So just like we would do this in Ain and Kaif, if we pause, if we just say that word, or if we say those words at the very end of a sentence with a full stop, without it being connected speech, we can end with a sukun. But if we're going to connect it to another word, we have to put a fatah on them. So words like ayn and kaif and amin, when they're connected, we're going to have to give them a haraka. We're going to have to give them a fatah or a kasra. And there's other examples that have a kasra, but the ones that he gave here are ones that have fatha. okay? So, just like it is given a fatha in the words ayn and kaif, ayna and kaif when they're connected, and it is not given a kestra here since kestra is very heavy after ya. So he gives a reason why we would end up, why the in Arabic phonology, we would end up giving it a fatha instead of a kestra, because having that ya with a sukun and then another kestra, it's, just, it's too heavy on the tongue to do it. This is a summary of what is associated with the pronunciation of Anin. And I have expanded on this, providing the proofs and additional opinions in my book, Tahdeeb Asma' Wal Lughat. And this is printed, I think, in two or four volumes, I can't remember. But in it, what Imam Anawi does is he will give a word and then he'll give its pronunciation. He'll give a word and then he'll explain which of the letters have dots on them and whether the dots are above or below. And the reason for this is that Arabic words were often written without the dots. Okay, the earliest Quranic manuscripts don't have dots on them. And when the Quran was originally written down, they did it without dots because they didn't have dots then. But then they later ad added dots, and we're going to cover this much later. But a lot of Arabic, when it's written quickly, it's written without dots. Because the, the person who is a native speaker of Arabic at that time or someone who mastered Arabic, he would he could automatically put the dots on there. He would know what the word was. 
Now imagine this, we today, when we learn Arabic, when you're in your beginning stages and intermediate stages, you need to have vowels or you need to have a lot of vowels written on the letters. But after you get more advanced, you don't need those vowels anymore. You automatically know where the vowels go and which are the right ones, right? Well, these guys went even further. They didn't even need the dots. They were able to, based on context, they were able to discern which word went there and which dots. And from that, they would know which dots went there. Okay, so anyways, um, enough of that. So, um, in Tahdib al Asma wa Lughat, he would tell us where the dots go. And he would say, for example, a sod with a, a dot on top of it, which is how they would explain that it's a bod. Okay, so he would give us that. And then he would give which ones have kasras, fathas, and dhammas, and sukuns. So he would then give us the vowels. And then he would also tell us. Um, if there's variance on it and he might tell us where a word comes from and he'll give the meaning of the word and he gives a lot of this in an appendix at the end of this book and something it might seem today that this is just crazy why would people do this they would do this in order to ensure that the Arabic language like every not body of transmitted knowledge related to Islam or needed to understand Islamic knowledge was transmitted to us, both good and bad. And by the way, this is why we have collections of hadith that include nasty stuff that is definitely not authentic. It comes with a chain of transmission, which allows people to then weigh it. Why would they even include it in their books? So that people who were masters of transmitted knowledge and the people who transmitted it would be able to know what's good and what's bad and they'd be able to have all of the knowledge that was transmitted. And by the way, even like in the very, very earliest generations, even really weak hadiths or fabricated hadiths from the very first generations, these have a value. They might not have a, val a legal value and that they're not prophetic utterances or that they're not strong enough to follow in legal rulings and they might not even be strong enough for when it comes to the merits of actions but the first couple generations of Muslims they had a purity of Arabic speech and so even in these fabricated hadiths and these weak hadiths they have a linguistic value because if they even forgeries that have been transmitted to us with an authentic chain have a value of transmitting valid language because people when they forged hadiths they usually did it with correct arabic language so we have uh, mashallah our early generations of scholars did so much work to preserve everything that was out there okay they preserved everything the rose, the stem, the thorns. They preserve to us the entire picture. So anyways, this is, mashallah, an amazing work that they've done for us, okay? So Imam Anawi in Tahdib al-Asma' wa lughat he clarifies all of these things. He's going to clarify what a word is, where the dots go, where the, di where the vowels go what it means, what the variations on the meanings are. He'll often give evidence for those various meanings. Evidence in language, of course. This is why poetry is so important, because we often dip into poetry to give us the pronunciation or the meaning of a word. So it's a huge amount. Now, and this is also why Arabic linguistics, like linguistics, this is considered a science, because there's empirical data that they can analyze in order to construct and then prove theories so enough of this all right so now that we've got the pronunciation of amin and the meaning of amin and some other stuff he says the scholar said that saying amin in prayer is recommended for the one leading the prayer so the imam says it his followers say it and it's also recommended for individuals praying alone 
and the imam and the individual praying alone should audibly pronounce amin in the audible prayers. Okay, so the amin when he prays, maghrib, asha, fajr, eid prayers, juma prayers, and other audible prayers, they should make amin audible. What about people who are praying behind an imam? So he says, next. Scholars disagree, however, concerning the audibility of someone following an, a, uh, an imam. The soundest opinion is that one should say amin audibly. The second is that he should not. And the third is that he should say it audibly if he prays with a large congregation. Otherwise, he does not. So let me jot this down as there being a typo right there under the word audible. It should be audibly. Okay, so something to keep in mind also is that when Imam and we list off several opinions here where one is stronger and the other ones are not so strong, it's quite common that the non muatamid the non-official positions of the Shafi Madhab are opinions in other Madhahib. And so sometimes it gives us a hint at why people who don't follow our school do something differently. Okay, so at the mosque, people will often question, are we supposed to be saying I mean out loud or not? I'm not quite sure what we should be doing. Well, according to the Shafis, you should be saying it audibly. But don't be surprised if one of the other madhahib comes to a different conclusion. And so as long as these reasonably strong positions are out there if there's no reason to fight about it okay we can clarify to people what's best but if they're following a valid opinion according to our school or one of the other schools it's nothing to break a community up about anyways we don't need to get into that what's important right now is the sound opinion in the madhab is that even the follower is going to say amin audibly in Prayers where recitation is out loud and audible. And Allah knows best. All right. So now that we've talked, now that we brought in the issue that the soundest and the Mu'tamid position, the Madhab, is that the followers should say Amin. And we know that the Imam needs to say Amin. Now we have the issue of do the followers say it before, after, or with him? Because if everyone's going to be saying it, do they say it with him, before him, or after him? And yes, it, you might automatically know, well, he, they can't say it before him. Sure, I agree. But it's one of the rational possibilities. And so we need to do something to rule it out. We have to have a reason for ruling it out. We can't just rule it out without justification. So even though it seems obvious that it's going to be ruled out, it's because the justification is pretty obvious. Anyways, the follower saying Amin should say it simultaneously with the Imam, not before or after because of the statement of the Prophet Wasallam in the rigorously authenticated hadith. If the Imam says, Waladhalin, say Amin, since whoever's Amin concurs with the Amin of the angels, his previous sins are forgiven. Okay, first thing, here's some of our evidence for saying Amin in prayer. Imam Anawi didn't give it earlier because it's so well known. Well, here's one of them. Another thing, this doesn't say that you should make your Amin simultaneous to the Imam, right? Correct, it doesn't. But it does tell us that there is a single point of time in which Amin should be said, right? It should be said concurrently to the angels. What's going to trigger the angels to say it? Are they just going to say it on their own? Or is something going to trigger? The assumption here is that they are saying it with the imam. And the, the imam's recitation of al-Fatiha is also what triggered it. Okay, so if it's supposed to be simultaneous to the angels, the malaika, the assumption here is that if it's if it needs to be simultaneous to something, 
we're going to take it back to the Imam, that they're going to be following the Imam. And also notice we have the other hadith that the Imam is there to follow. So he doesn't mention it here, but that's external evidence that sends us in the direction that it's the Imam's pronunciation of Amin that is going to be the benchmark for both the Malaika and for us to follow. Okay, so when do we say it? Simultaneously. How could we have ruled out that we don't say it before? Because, well, the Imam is there to be followed, and we're not allowed to precede him in actions. There's one of the reasons, okay. As for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's statement, if the Imam says Amin, then say Amin. Okay, so if the Imam says Amin, then say Amin. This would indicate to us that we shouldn't be starting it until he's finished it, right? So does Imam Anawi not know about this? Well, obviously, if he's mentioning it, he does. But how do we respond to this other evidence? Because the way the fuqaha work is they don't just cherry pick a single hadith or a single verse. They look at everything. Okay, there is a, a principle in, in usul al-fiqh and the methodologies of Islamic jurisprudence that acting according to evidence is better than either ignoring it or deactivating it. So what the fuqaha would do, what the scholars would do, is they would look at all of the evidence on the subject. If it was too weak to be worthy of consideration, they would put it to the side. If it was strong enough to be accepted in fiqh rulings, then they would have to find some way to build a coherent narrative about it, to use that fun term, that sexy word, narrative. Okay, they would have to find an ex they would have to find something that explains how it all works. So what does the evidence lead to? How do we explain this body of evidence? Okay, so here's something he needs to explain. If we're going to go with the first hadith, what do we do about this one? Is there a reason that we're not going to give it primacy here? So Imam Anawi says, as for the prophets saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if the Imam says, Amin, then say, Amin. This implies that one would say Amin when the Imam is about to say Amin. Okay, that makes sense. That, that, that makes sense as an explanation. Is there anything else that's similar to that? Yeah. There's something we're supposed to say when we enter the toilet. There's a dhikr we say when we enter the toilet. Do we say it after we've entered the toilet or before? Because the hadith tells us that if we entered past tense. And what about um, seeking protection, saying, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim before we recite. If you remember in the segment on that, we had a similar situation where a past tense complete verb was used. So if you recited the Qur'an, then say, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim past tense, right? But we know that the proper understanding of this is if you want or plan or are about to or intend to recite, then do this. A similar thing is here. Where we're going, we have reasons for taking the past tense verb or a past tense or an afterwards action and understanding it to mean if you intended to. Okay, so if the imam says, Amin, then say imam. Uh, Amin. This implies that one should say Amin when the Imam is about to say Amin. Okay, so what we do is he's finding a way to reconcile the two statements and read them together and giving each one justice and its proper due. Okay, our Shafi companion said that there is no occasion during prayer in which it is recommended that the followers utterance be simultaneous with the Imams except in saying Amin. All other utterances such as Allahu Akbar that commences the prayer and precedes the prayer's various postures are said after the Imam's utterances. Okay, so when the Imam says Allahu Akbar to start the prayer, you have to say it after him. If you say it before him, how are you joining a prayer if it hasn't started? 
Okay, we can rule that one out quickly. If you say it simultaneously to him, he hasn't uttered it. He hasn't fully entered his prayer yet. So how can you chain your prayer on his? So for takbiratul ihram, it has to be said afterwards. Okay, when the imam is transitioning between motions and he says, Allahu Akbar, we are not supposed to begin our motions until he's at the end of his, right? We're supposed to let him complete his motions first. And if that's the case, then we can't be doing our adhkar while he's moving and we're not yet moving, okay? So that one also, we can't do it really simultaneously. But this is the exception that when it comes to saying Amin, we are supposed to say Amin at the same time the Imam does. This is an exception to the general rule. That is all we're going to read today in this segment. Next up, we're going to get into rulings about the prostration at the recitation of passages of the Quran. This is Sujuda Sajda, or the Sajadat of the Quran. It's going to be long. It's a little bit complicated. And inshallah, we'll be able to get through it. We'll take it step by step. Um, maybe I will do some diagrams to try to keep things easier to hold in our mind. Um, but it's going to take several segments to go through it. And you need to be patient. Because in the end, it's all, it's all going to make sense. But you have to be patient as we go through it. So that's all I'm going to read today. And until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.